What are we doing? We're gonna watch this thing. What is it? Oh, a movie? No, it's an animatic. Oh, an automatic? No, not automatic, an animatic. What are we doing? Oh, we're gonna watch our mother automatic. Look, why don't you two guys just shut up and watch, huh? That would be a good idea. City Cats by Jeff Danziger. New York City, night, about 7 o'clock in early March. Raining, thunder, lightning. Water sluicing down the gutters, alleys, garbage cans, rats dodging into the sewers, dogs huddling, homeless people in boxes and tarps. Sydney Katz, voice over. This is the city, my city. My name is Sydney Katz, I'm a private eye, a detective. I used to be a cop, but uh, it didn't work out, you could say that. I work alone, I live alone. Well, almost alone. Interesting town, always something going on. Sometimes legal, sometimes uh, not so much. You could say it depends on the people, and the weather, and the traffic. Exterior, George Washington Bridge, Fort Lee End. Radio voice. And give yourself 20 more minutes on the George coming into Manhattan due to heavy rain. Also, some police action near Fort Lee. Coming up, weather for the week. More rain. The black car moves through the traffic. Cuts off other cars. Split is driving. He has a small hatchet lodged in his head, which cannot be removed. In the front seat is the boss, large cadaverous character who runs the gang. The red cat is inside his coat. In the back is Thog, a general purpose thug. And out of here, a scrawny mob mole whose voice could cut glass. She has the worst New York accent on record. Split. Get out of the way, you morons. Out of here. Oh, look at this rain. This is a lousy time to be doing this. I told you so, but you don't listen. I told you. This is a bad night. I got a bad feeling. I'm telling you. Move it. You don't listen. You just don't listen to anything I say. I'm telling you this is a... Shut up! You don't tell me to shut up. I got as much right to talk as any of you dopes. Well, if you'd shut up, I wouldn't have to tell you to shut up. Oh, this is going to be a disaster. All this rain, my stomach is churning. I say, I say we wait. What's wrong with we wait? Boss turns in his seat, draws his arm to hit out of here. But the cat voice... No. Boss does not hit out of here. Hmm. They ride on across the bridge. They turn down the West Side Highway, then left into the city. Rain continues. They continue across the West Side to the Diamond District. Uh, listen, so maybe if we stop and get something to eat, some food or something, that would calm me down because because uh, I always get calm when I eat. And keep that stinking cat away from me. What you bring that cat along for? Cats? Yuck! Exterior, the Diamond District, West 47th Street. Orthodox Jews are closing their stores, pulling down their displays of jewelry and watches, turning off lights, getting dressed for the weather, black raincoats, flat brim hats, good-natured bonani. They pull down the security gates. All have black umbrellas except one who has a pink My Little Pony umbrella. Laughter from the others. <laughs> At the end of the street, the black car waits. The boss is uneasy. He takes out a piece of paper from his pocket, unfolds it, we see a word scrawled, tonight. Red cat licks the boss's face. The orthodox dealers move down the sidewalk, laughing and talking. One is behind, struggling with the umbrella. The boss says, him. The boss pulls on an orthodox hat. Split and Thog do the same. They get out and accost the lagging jewelry dealer. Hey, uh, you forgot something inside. The dealer looks around in fear. They push him back toward the door. Don't worry. We aren't gonna hurt you. Just open the door. The dealer turns and opens the door. They push him into the shop. Toward the back, the boss has a flashlight, signs it on a safe, makes a motion for the jewelry dealer to open it. The dealer works the combination and opens the door. Okay, no tricks now. I said we're not gonna hurt you. Oh, wait. Were you gonna push the alarm? See? Broken. The dealer is nervous as hell. Boss points to the jewel box, marked the five angels. He opens it. Five perfect diamonds. Boss pockets the jewel box. The black car. Dealer in the back seat. Oh my god! 
Why'd you bring him along for? Why didn't you just leave him there? This is a mistake. This is a big mistake. Why didn't you listen to me? God, you're all so stupid. I told you, he's not going to get hurt. The black car leaves 47th Street. Cruises along through the streets north to the George Washington Bridge. The traffic is less on the bridge. They cross it. Halfway across, the boss tells Split to stop the car. He tells the jewelry dealer to get out. The boss and the dealer stand by the railing. A few seconds go by. The boss waves at the city skyline. Look at that. New York. Ain't it beautiful? Take a good look. It's like a big diamond, ain't it? He takes out a gun. We see a long shot of the bridge. We hear a gunshot. Three seconds later, we hear a splash. The boss alone gets back in the car. What'd you do? Are you crazy? You killed him? Are you out of your mind? You said you weren't going to hurt him. Yeah, well, that didn't hurt. The car takes off again toward Jersey. At the end of the bridge, some police cars are parked. Split sees the police officer looking at him. Damn. Suddenly, he is very nervous. Keep calm now. They don't know anything. One police officer notices the car and Split's profile. Split freaks out. The boss tries to calm him. Keep calm, damn it. Don't do anything stupid. I ain't going back to jail. I'm telling you, I ain't going back to jail. Split wrenches the wheel, guns the black car, almost hits the police car, bounces off a second police car, screeches across the lane, and races back across the bridge toward the city, squealing wheels, man, confusion inside the car. Red Cat pokes his head out of the boss's coat, fearful. Snap, for God's sake! Split is mad with fear. Car chase across the George Washington Bridge. Black car weaving in and out of traffic. We hear out of here, screaming in the back seat. I told you, but you never listened to me. I told you this was a bad night. You're stupid, stupid, stupid. The black car reaches New York end of the bridge. Police in pursuit, far behind. Black car races around the exit lanes and darts up the back street. Boss, stop! Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God! Boss tries to wrench the wheel away. Split hits the brakes. Black car stops in the street. Boss gets out of the car. Where are you going? Where is he going? He's got the rocks. Boss slams the door and takes off, runs down the alley. Sirens are closer yet. Stop him! He's got the diamonds! Boss runs down the alley out of breath, looks around anxiously. Hiss, says the cat. Boss spies a dumpster, lifts the lid and crawls in. Minutes later, Sidney Katz walks along in the rain. He is angular, tall, hunched over, wearing an old fedora, now wet from the rain. Tattered raincoat pulled up around his neck. Sirens coming closer. Sidney comes to his building. On the ground floor of his building is Wing Hop's Chinese Restaurant, an old-style New York Chinese restaurant, brightly lit, flickering sign. Sidney stops and goes through his pockets. No cash. He goes into the restaurant just as the police cars screech by a siren. Sidney talks up Mrs. Wing. Ah, Mrs. Wing, how's the little flower of Singapore tonight? How's my credit? Your credit? Just fine, Mr. Katz. Oh, good. Well, I'll have a dozen of your best egg rolls, if you please. Sidney looks out the window while waiting for the egg rolls. More police cars scream by. He gets his egg rolls in the bag, goes outside, looks after the police car, and shrugs. Sidney looks up at the fourth floor window. He holds up the wing hop's bag. In the window above, he sees, and we see, two little cat heads in partial silhouette. Sydney calls to the upstairs window, Dinner! Sydney goes up four flights of stairs while the titles run. Elevator broken, has been for a long time. Some lights work, most don't. Office stores seen. Chong Brothers, Import, Export, Gold, Frankincense, and Murphy, Attorneys, Jess Hummett, Theatrical Agent. Sydney's office, later. Dinner time. On the desk... Louis is reading the Police Gazette, Lurid Crime Magazine, cover story, Crime Wave, Drowns New York. Sydney is reading the Racing Form, Duke is reading the New Yorker. Office has old furniture, refrigerator not working, door propped open, coffee machine has seen better days, old desk, old file cabinet. Rear door of office leads back to a room with a couch where Sydney sleeps. Sydney reads the Racing Form, makes notes. Louis comes over to see what Sidney is reading. Okay, now look at this. A mutter. You know what a mutter is? No. A mutter is a horse that does well on a muddy track, like now, because it's raining. Oh. Yeah, see, the experienced turf aficionado takes all of this into consideration in his studies. Wow. Yes, and fortunately for you two fuzzballs, I am an experienced turf aficionado. So, we eat regular. Look, Sydney, there's a crime wave. Did you know about the crime wave? 
alley where the dumpster and the cat are hiding. Thunder and lightning. The boss lifts the cover of the dumpster, looks out, sees a police car at the end of the alley. The police car turns slowly. We hear the crackling police radio. Back inside Sydney's office, Louis and Sydney are finishing the last of the egg rolls. Louis. Who? Oh, who do you think those guys are chasing, Sydney? I don't know. Maybe they're chasing the donut gang. The donut gang? Yeah, all 12 of them in a box. Come on, Sydney. It sounds like there's more crime going on. More criminals, right? Yeah, maybe you're right. On the other hand, maybe you're wrong. I don't care. I don't do that stuff. I don't do criminals anymore. And you know why? Because criminals have guns. So I leave that up to the police department. I do nice, safe detective work. Oh, yeah, but sometimes you find criminals. I only find criminals by mistake. I do insurance fraud and sometimes odd romantic intrigue. Nice, safe stuff where people pay me to do it. Oh, yeah, I know, but there's a crime wave. Yeah, you want to see my crime wave? Sydney holds up one hand and waves. Bye-bye. But, 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 but we could help, couldn't we? We? Who's we? Oh, me and Duke, because, see, nobody would suspect us because we're just cats. Sidney pulls a bottle of whiskey out of the drawer, pours himself a tot. Here, to insurance fraud. Yeah, you're cats and you can talk, and that is amazing, I agree. You know what? So what? Let me tell you what talks. Money talks. Everything else walks. He pours a second tot. He toasts. To old friends. Old friends. Well, we're your friends, Sidney. Me and Duke. Yeah, I know. Two cats for friends. Well, we, we try to be friends. Well, I gotta look on the bright side. If I didn't have you two guys, I wouldn't have any friends at all. Oh, I ain't got no business. My telephone don't ring. Got no red hot mama to make my spirit sing. I eat Chinese takeout. Winter, spring, summer, and fall. On the bright side, if it wasn't for these egg rolls, I wouldn't eat no food at all. Sometimes I play the horses, I either win or lose, and then I drown my sorrows and celebrate with booze. I'm living with a couple of cats, yeah, I'm up against the wall. On the bright side, if it wasn't for you two cats, I wouldn't have no friends at all. Danger. I used to fight the crime, the cheaters and beaters and bottom feeders and all that rotten slime. But now I live much safer. I don't have a gun at all. On the bright side, well, you may say it's boring, but insurance fraud can be a ball. On the bright side, if it wasn't for Chinese food, if it wasn't for playing the horses And if it weren't for you two cats I wouldn't have no life at all oh, thank, you. thank you very much, thank you very much, thank you very much Alley with the dumpster, boss pushes open the lid of the dumpster, struggles to get out Lands on his feet, grins meanly he takes the diamond case out of his pocket and opens it. Light from the diamonds illuminates his face. Red Cat hisses. Boss closes the jewel case. It's clear who's in command. Back in Sydney's office. Dark. Sydney is asleep in the back room, snoring loudly. We see a picture framed. A younger Sydney and a woman, Marilyn, and a writing, Love you always, Marilyn. Out in the office, Louie and Duke are curled up. Well, Duke is anyway. You see, that's the problem, is organization. If we could get all the cats in the city, and there must be a million, so if we could get all of their names and addresses, then we could contact them, see? 
Why would we want to do that? Well, maybe there's an emergency, or maybe we want to make some changes in the way things are going. This country's going bad, you know. Somebody has to do something. Louis, we are cats. We don't care. Oh, that's the whole problem. Apathy. Nobody cares. No ambition. All these cats do is eat and sleep. What's wrong with that? Because we'll never get anywhere. We have to get organized. Wow, the things that we could do if we could only communicate with all of the other cats. Louis, please, we are cats. That's the way things are. Get used to it. You're a cat, and you are always going to be a cat. Yeah, I know. It's really getting on my nerves. Now stop talking, please. I said please. I am trying to get some sleep. Oh, well, you slept all day. And I'm going to sleep all day tomorrow. Louis tries to sleep, tosses and turns the little dream balloons above his head. He is chasing robbers. They shoot at him. As the sound of the dream shots, Louis jerks around in his sleep. A newspaper headline flashes by. Louis the cat solves crime. The next morning, gray light through the dirty windows. Headlines, police corruption charged. Scandal reaches the highest ranks. St. Patrick's Day parade threatened. Sydney slops a little coffee into saucers for the cats. Now, police corruption. Who'd have thunk it? Well, gents, I'm off. Big case, you know. Where are you going, Sydney? Ah, uh, I'm tracking somebody down. <laughs> Sydney puts on his coat fedora, sticks the racing form under his arm. He leaves the office. Louis jumps up to the window. He sees Sydney on the bus. The bus sign reads, Aqueduct Racetracks. Horses? Look, I bet somebody stole a horse. Maybe they murdered a horse. Sydney's going to find them. This is a criminal case. Oh, I wish he would let us help. We could do stuff. We could answer the phone. Louie, you can't answer the phone unless the phone rings. And the phone never rings. Oh, I want to make something of myself. Make something of myself. Make something of myself. That's what I want to do. Cat, schmack. I could be more than that. I could be a contender, not laying around with that. I want to make a mark in history. Do something for my legacy. Not napping and snoozing, living a life of lethargy. There's never been a cat like me who can talk and read and write and solve mysteries and crimes and fight for what's right. I want to make something of myself. Make something of myself. Make something of myself. That's what I want to do. Cat out. Boom. Wing Hop's restaurant in the morning. Mr. and Mrs. Wing are stocky Chinese restaurant owners. Wing Lee is their daughter helping them with the cleaning. She is beautiful. Louie and Duke show up. Mr. Wing says, Oh, look, Mrs. Wing, our cats are back. You have come back, Bui Tin. Mrs. Wing, Welcome back, Bui Tin. Are you hungry? Yes, I'm um, actually... Do shh. I mean, uh, meow. Mr. and Mrs. Wing don't know that cats can talk, but Wing Lee, their daughter, does. Mrs. Wing gives them a bag of egg rolls. Here, yeah, egg rolls, your favorite. Wing Lee, don't forget some sauce. Thank you. Wing Lee gives cats the little envelopes of soy sauce, glances backwards at her parents. She smiles. She knows the cats can talk. It's their little secret. Inside Sydney's office later, the cats have stuffed themselves with egg rolls. They have round tummies. Louis burps. Excuse me. Phone rings. Louis jumps up and looks at the phone. Duke, what are you doing? Louis pushes the button to answer. Hello. Um... Sydney Cats Detective Agency. Who's that? Who's that? Sydney Cats Detective Agency. What? City Cats? Louis, after a moment of consideration. Uh, yeah. City Cats Detective Agency. Oh, no. Outside in Sydney Street a moment later, the woman, Poinsettia, struggling along in the wind. She comes to Sydney's building. She's a tough customer, a gang mall from the old school. She enters and starts up the stairs. At the top of the stairs, Poinsettia enters, puffing and huffing. Louis is sitting in Sydney's chair. I sure hope Sydney gets back before. Now you let me do the talking. Don't worry. Don't worry, he says. Poinsettia doesn't knock. She just opens the door and looks around. She is breathing hard. <sighs> Anybody here? Where is everybody, huh? Uh, please have a seat. Who said that? Who said that, eh? Uh, I did. Please have a seat. Where is everybody? Poinsettia walks around the deck. She sees Louis. She picks him up. She inspects his back for batteries. 
She pokes his tummy. Eh, what is this? Some kind of fun house? I need a detective. I gotta find my louse of a boyfriend. What's going on? Uh, if you could just put me down. When Celia realizes the cat is talking. Oh my God! She drops Louis. He scrambles back up into the chair. Um, um, he can talk, ma'am. Uh, so can I. Now, if you just tell us your problem, maybe we can help. Oh my God! Oh my God! Talking cats. This town gets weirder by the moment. Oh no, I know what it is. It's the Russians. It's the Russians. Oh my God! Poinsettia flops down in a chair. She seems to accept the situation. She goes through her purse. Okay, okay. This is weird. Okay, yes, very weird. What are you, like a, like a robot cat or something? She leans forward to speak to Duke. She holds up a newspaper clipping. Can you see this? She holds it up in Duke's face. This is my louse of a boyfriend. He's rotten to the core. Use, you just gotta find him. You see? You find him so I can get my money and then kill him, okay? Uh, um, okay. She holds up in the headline, Mob Accountant Gets the Boot, Louis Beagleman is Deported. Yeah, this is him. This is the creep. He owes me a lot of money. You find him and you can, uh, you can keep half. And here's the creep's last known address. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Where's Sidney Katz? Uh, Mr. Katz was called away on an important case. Yeah? yeah I'll just bet. She tosses a piece of paper on the desk. I gotta get out of here. If it's okay with you two little robots, will excuse me. I know you's a robot. Uh, don't worry, ma'am. We'll... The door slams. We'll uh, do our best. Outside, Sydney is coming down the street in a very good mood. Meets Poinsettia coming out of the door of the building. They bump into each other. I'm sorry? Please excuse me. That was all my fault. Ah, you clumsy jerk. Yep, that's me. Now, oh, wait a minute. Are you Sydney Katz? Uh, never heard of him. Sidney enters the office, full of himself. He has had a good day at the track. No, no, no applause. Thank you all very much, but let's face it. Sidney Katz can pick him, and when I pick him, I pick him. Three little ponies right in a row. One, two, three, ends they dre. A better judge of horse flesh you ain't finding. Sidney empties his pockets, tickets and money. You see, my little friends, this is the payoff. Megillah, Shekel City. The reward for many days of hard work. Nose to the old grindstone. A beautiful, beautiful day. Uh, Sydney? Um, Sydney? Now, 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 my fuzzy friend. Just because you can talk does not mean you can interrupt. As I was saying, the gods were smiling. Uh, but Sydney? Now we're going to have a moment of silent reflection. Sydney closes his eyes and smiles. Ah, the hell with that. Let's celebrate General Tao's chicken and a movie. All in favor? Yay! Yay! Out in the alley, the red cat and the boss are skulking. A police car blocks their path. Officer pays no attention. Boss stops in front of the police car. He holds up the red cat. Driver pays no attention. They are drinking coffee and eating donuts. Street in front of the movie theater. Sydney is walking toward the theater. Louis and Duke are stuffed in the pockets of his raincoat, little heads sticking out. At the box office, the poster is for a hard-boiled detective movie. The gun spoke French. Uh, one ticket, please. Uh, one human. Sidney takes Louis and Duke out of his pockets and places them in the seats next to either side of him. They watch the movie, goggle-eyed. A voice from the movie. You see there, Sergeant? All she was wearing was a band-aid. Sidney, what's a band-aid? You'll see, hopefully. We've got to act quickly. Every second counts. What do you think did it, Sidney? I don't know. Now just sit still, okay? A patron in the row behind them says, Shh, Sidney. Sorry, sorry. Look, Sergeant, another Band-Aid. Now you see, that's a Band-Aid, okay? Oh, I see. Hey, be quiet, huh? Sorry, sorry. They sit watching the flickering image. Movie music plays. The cats are goggle-eyed. Movie voice. That Band-Aid is a clue. What's a clue, Sidney? You'll see. I'll explain later. But, hey, would you knock off the talking, would you? Sidney pauses for a moment. He picks Louie up by the scruff of his neck and turns to the patron behind him. Uh, well, look, sir, I gotta explain the movie to my cat, don't I? Under one of the abutments of the George Washington Bridge at night, the black car is parked in the shadows. Thog, Split, and Outta Here are reviewing the facts. All that for nothing! Shut up. You can't tell me to shut up. You stoops. Everybody telling me to shut up. Why don't you stoops listen to me? I should be running this organization. I said it was a bad night. I said wait for a better time, but oh no. Big Brain told me to shut up, and now what do we got? Nothing. Well, I'll tell you, I ain't gonna shut up. 
Something stinks about this whole thing. You think he double-crossed us? He ain't smart enough to double-cross us. Oh, double-cross? Ah, oh, oh my god, somebody double-cross us. What do you use for brains? Scrambled eggs? Him? Smart? Are you kidding me? My cat's smart enough. Well, somebody's cat is. If we only knew where he was hiding, I'd like to get my hands around his... Back in Sydney's office later that evening. Uh, so what did you think of the movie? I mean, uh, cinematically. Oh, it's a very good movie, Sydney. I thought the uh, female lead was a little weak. Yeah, I thought so, too. I like when he said, every second counts. The lay could be disastrous. Sydney yawns and stretches. So, uh, tell me again. This lady comes up here. Louis, excited to be back on the subject. Yeah, she said, if we find her boyfriend, who is a mouse. A louse, but do go on. Well, we can keep half the money he owes her. Yeah, well, you know something? Eaton always makes me real sleepy, isn't that the darndest thing? And here's the address she gave us. We could go over there and get started. Yeah, maybe a little nap, sharpen up the senses, you know? But, 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 Sydney, the lady said... The lady? Well, let me tell you a little wisdom from the voice of experience. Dames is poison. Get it? Poison. Louis pauses, thinking. Hey, I got an idea. Why don't you two take over the case? You seem to have an ardent interest in such matters. Sidney gets up, stretches, and headed for the back room where he has a couch for sleeping. Louis waits, thinking. Snoring comes from the back room. Okay, let's go now. Let's? Who? You and me? You heard Sidney. He said we could take over the case. Sidney was being sarcastic. Sidney is never sarcastic. Sidney is always sarcastic. Every second counts. The lake could be disastrous. Look, first of all, it's still raining. Second, we don't know where this place is. And third, I don't want to go. Don't you want to be a detective? No. You said you wanted to be a detective. I never said that. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. You said you wanted to be a detective. I said nothing. Well, if you say nothing, it's like you want to do it, too. What? The staircase inside Sydney's building. The cats are going down. Duke has a plastic bag over his head from Wing Hop's restaurant. You take that bag off your head, you don't look like a detective. That's because I'm not a detective. At the bus stop in the rain, the bus pulls up. Passenger gets off, the cats get on. The bus driver is surprised, but she doesn't throw them off. The bus driver is a large, kindly woman. The bus driver says, Ah, where are you two orphans off to? You're all wet. You just sit there by the heater. I got a cat like you home. And we, uh... Then he remembers not to talk. Louis shows the bus driver a piece of paper with the address on it. There are three passengers. Um, you can't let those cats on. I'm allergic to cats. I might have an allergic attack or something. You want to get off? I have an attack and I'm, I, I might die. Lady two. I like cats. Poor things. Let them stay on. They're homeless. I'd like to get home. Can we just get moving? Um, are they paying? I mean, the rest of us are paying. Bus driver points to the sign that says, Under six, ride for free. Uh, how old are you? You don't look six to me. Louis starts to reply and then remembers and holds up five paws. Did you say something? Duke. Um, he said meow. The bus driver totally flummoxed, puts the bus in gear and drives. Exterior, gloomy street outside the Excelsior Hotel. All the letters on the neon sign are out except H and O's. We see the red cat peering out of the boss's room. Sign blinks, ho. Ho, ho. Boss is asleep on the bed. The jewelry box with the five angels is on the table. Boss snores fitfully. Red Cat opens the jewelry box. The light from the jewels illuminate its face. Boss snorts in his sleep. The Red Cat quickly closes the box, runs back to the window. Exterior, an even gloomier street near the river. Boss pulls away, leaving Louis and Duke on the sidewalk. They crowd under the wing hop's plastic bag. Louis reads the paper with the address on it. This is it. Building in front door is chained shut. Condemnation notice from the city of New York. Across the street, a decrepit building is the construction site. Some lights are strung in the construction area. They go down the alley. They see another cat run into a window. They look in the dark window. Basement of the window is the home of many cats. Unfriendly. Light adjusts so we can see these are feral cats. Um, uh, anybody here speak uh, English? Cats in the basement. Hiss at him. Now, uh, we're just looking for a bad guy. We're detectives, see? Listen, you fellas and ladies, um, they're going to knock this building down. Um, so there's this guy, Beagle, and maybe he lives here? Anybody know anything? Giving up, Louie and Duke run past the feral cats. Up here! They run up the stairs, wind and rain blow into the smashed windows, cracked plaster. At last, the fourth floor. A dark hall leads away from the stairs. Some light comes through the construction site. Here! This is the room! Duke joins him. This is it? Yeah! Wow! We found it! Yeah, wow!
The door to the room is ajar, dark inside. Okay, okay, so why don't you go in there and look around and see what you can find, and I'll, uh, I'll stay out here and stand guard, hmm? Why don't I go in there? Why don't you go in there? I'll stand guard. You're the detective. I might miss something. Ah, uh, oh, uh, okay. Louis gets up his nerve and goes into the room. He disappears into the darkness. Duke stands in the hall and waits. The sound of wind, the fog horn, lonely in the night. He pulls the plastic bag around his shoulders. After about ten seconds, he calls into the room. Hey, you okay? I got it! Louis reappears, holding a card. It's a Florida's driver's license. Look, it's Beagleman's! See? Beagleman! That's him! Okay, good. Let's get out of here. They run off down the street, back toward the, where the bus left them off. Louis has Beagleman's license. But both cats are lost, and the weather is miserable. Wind blows the garbage down the street. Are you cold? I'm cold. I'm not cold. Yes, you are. Come here. They huddle together. Duke tries to share the wing hops bag. Then they get into a free distribution box, which is for flyers for self-improvement courses. Flyers say, lose weight, grow hair, learn French. At the end of the block, a boy, Mike, is on a bicycle seen coming forward. Mike is a good-looking Asian kid forced to make a living delivering takeout in all sorts of weather. He is soaking wet, struggling against the wind. He's not loving his job. On the back of the bike is a box to hold the deliveries. Duke sticks his head out of the newspaper box and sees Mike. Hey! Duke waves at Mike on the bicycle. Mike stops, makes a face. Duke holds up the wing hop bag. It's us! Please, we're lost! Mike picks up the two cats, looking at them closely, and puts them into the delivery box. Louie, by this time, is so cold and wet he can't speak. Mike starts off with the cats half visible in the delivery box. They ride along through the wet streets. Duke finds a fortune cookie in the delivery box. He tries to feed it to Louie. Louie munches on the fortune cookie. Duke reads the fortune. It says, you are a good friend. Mike on the bicycle pulls up in front of Wing Hop's restaurant, takes Louie and Duke out of the delivery box on the back of the bike. They are appreciative and they run inside. Wing Lee comes out and gives Mike a kiss and a hug. And then another kiss. Mike leaves, smiling. In the boss's room at the Excelsior Hotel, by the light of the blinking ho-ho-ho sign, we can see the red cat is doing something. The boss is still sleeping. The red cat has opened the jewel box and is eating the five angels one at a time. The boss wakes up, looks out the window. How'd they find me? He sees the black car parked across the street. The boss starts to get dressed. He hears footsteps in the hall. Terrified, he takes out his gun. He puts the jewel case, which we now know is empty, and stuffs it in his pocket. Split is coming up the stairs. He has a gun. He comes down the hall to the room next to the boss's room. It's the wrong room. Split kicks in the door of the wrong room. Couple in bed are petrified. Lady screams. Man yells, Don't shoot! Don't shoot! I can explain! Ah, uh, sorry, sorry. The door to the boss's room is open and the red cat bolts out into the hall. Freezes. Sees Split. Split sees the red cat. Split fires two shots at the red cat. Misses. Boss comes into the hall with his gun drawn. He sees Split. Outside the Hotel Excelsior, immediately thereafter, we hear shots and the lady still screaming. We don't know the resolution of the gunfight. The sign continues to blink. Ho, ho, ho. Back in Sydney's office, Louis and Duke are on the desk. Beagleman's license is also on the desk. Sydney looks at Beagleman's license. He picks it up. He is worried, now taking all of this seriously. Okay, okay, tell me again. Well, it was a dark and stormy night. We don't have all day. Oh, he was asleep. I, I took out his wallet, and then I took out the card, and then... He was asleep. Yeah. On his bed. Uh, no, on the floor. He was sleeping on the floor. Sidney looks at Duke. Ah, uh, Louis, people don't sleep on the floor. I sleep on the floor. Some detective you are. Louis realizes his stupid mistake. So, Arnold Beagleman, a cross between a rat and a snake who somehow looks like a man, has left this veil of tears with a little help from his friends. Sidney picks up the phone. Uh, did we do good, Sidney? It's a little too early to tell. Sidney dials. Exterior front door in the steps of the 80th precinct, one of Manhattan's oldest, huge, imposing granite entrance. Poles with old-style green-lighted globes on top. The globes say police, though some sad types lingering on the steps. We go up the stairs and inside. In the main room of the 80th precinct, the city room is crowded. Cops, perps, snitches, the usual. Pastel green walls, old desks, very old computers, wanted posters, raised magistrate's desk. To one side is the evidence room, fenced off. 
Posters are on the wall for St. Patrick's Day Parade Practice, 80th Precinct Bagpipe Marching Band. Framed pictures on the top of the top officers of the precinct. Large photo of the commissioner, mean expression. Next to the commissioner's picture is a picture of the officer of the month, Sergeant Bent, young, blonde, weaselly looking officer. Interior of the 80th Precinct near McGuffey's desk and Bent's desk. Bent watches McGuffey throughout. McGuffey is older, heavier lieutenant. White hair, white ragged mustache, wears a shoulder holster and a vest. McGuffey has a calendar on his desk marked days until retirement, three weeks to go. McGuffey's phone rings. He answers. McGuffey, homicide. Sydney, what a pleasant surprise. Ah, uh, surprise, yes. Pleasant, no. How you doing? Uh, nice to hear from you. What's up? Listen, I got something you might be interested in, in line with your crime-fighting activities. Well, why don't you bring it over? No, you know I can't do that, so you have to come here. Yeah, well, it better be worth it. Your stairs are murder on these old legs. You know, only three more weeks into retirement. Yes, Patrick, you're a lucky man. You can just sit around and do nothing. But this is something. Of course, if you'd rather not, I'll be over. It just better be worth it. Inside Sydney's office right after. Now, when McGuffey gets here, you'll remember, no talking. We'll let him get used to this phenomenon of talking cats slowly, okay? Okay, Sydney. So the word to remember is, shut up. I remember. No matter what. Yes, I, um, meow. Yeah, good. Back inside the police station, McGuffey pulls on his raincoat, gets ready to leave. Bent is watching, smiling, the smile of a rat. Ah, so where are you off to, McGuffey? Bent, I wouldn't tell you if I had a gun to my head. <laughs> I wish I could retire. Sit around and do nothing all day, but hey, you're good at that. Bent, one of these days, you're going to regret you said that. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Bent gets on the phone and reports to the commissioner. Inside Sydney's office, Sydney says to Louis, Now, remember. <sighs> Guffy comes to the door. Ah, Lieutenant McGuffey, welcome to the private sector. Save it, Sidney, what do you got? Patience, Patrick, a word of explanation, a certain suspension of disbelief. Yeah, whatever. Sidney tosses Beagleman's license on the desk. McGuffey picks it up and looks at it. Well, well, the evil Beagleman, rotten to the core. He was deported, I believe. Ah, uh, deported, yeah, you could say that in a manner of speaking. Oh, has evil befallen the Beagle? Ah, uh, he has been uh, deported to another sphere. And how did you come by this? Uh, a little friend told me. Who, your cat? Sydney uh, inhales and exhales. Now, Patrick, you're going to find this hard to believe. We go outside to the door of Sydney's office and we hear McGuffey roar. What? The door vibrates on its hinges. McGuffey is in the rage inside. You see, Sydney, this is why you got thrown off the police force. You are a nutcase. You are nuts. And now you're telling me your cat found the body. You think I got nothing else to do with my time? He storms around the office. This is not funny. I got three weeks to retire and nothing is going to screw that up. Patrick? You ask him. Ask the cat. Ask the cat. You are nuts. I'll tell you what your problem is. You're up here all day long with these stupid cats, and you go nuts. McGuffey gets up to leave. Patrick, the cat can talk. You are nuts. If I never see you again, it'll be too soon. McGuffey goes toward the door. Sydney holds out the license. Wait, I can, I can give this to you, or I can give it to somebody else. McGuffey pauses. My God, this town gets crazier every day. All right, once more. McGuffey turns, forcing himself to be calmer. Y you gotta listen, Patrick. I'm listening. Sidney looks over at Louis, who is now totally confused. Okay, tell him. Louis is frozen. His mouth hangs open. A few seconds elapse. McGuffey is glaring at Louis. Louis can't decide if it's okay to talk. Um, uh, meow? No, no, tell him how you found Beagleman. McGuffey blows up again. No, 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 don't tell me nothing. I'm out of here. He points a quivering finger at Sydney. I was your one friend on the force. I was your one friend when the whole city was against you. I was your friend when even your wife left you. Maybe she was right. You are crazy, and now you drag me up here to talk to your cat? We ought to pull your license, Sydney. In fact, I might recommend that. Your days as a private investigator may be over. I'm risking a heart attack coming up these stairs. You are a disaster waiting for a place to happen. You're as buggy as a flophouse mattress. Goodbye. McGuffey storms out, slams the door. Wasting my time with talking cats. <sighs> well, that went well. He pats Louis on the head. I'm sorry, Sidney. Oh, don't worry. I don't think he'll do anything. He was pretty mad. 
course, it is nice to have a friend on the police force. They could pull my license. <laughs> it's all my fault. No, oh, it wasn't. It was that woman. You see, I told you. Dames is poison. Really? Yeah, it's uh, Shakespeare. The red cat has escaped with a tummy still full of the five angel jewels. He's not feeling well. He skulks from trash can to trash can. The black car pulls up at the corner, out of here in the back seats looking out the window. As she sees the red cat, her eyes pop. She gets out screaming. There he is, that clousy cat. He knows. She starts after the red cat down the alley. The red cat takes off. Out of here is running. Boss steps out of the rear door, puts his foot out. Out of here trips. Ah! She goes sprawling. Looking for this. He shows her the hatchet that used to be a split's head. Out of here crawls backwards, scared. Now, now, boss, don't do anything. Your cat, he just got away. I was just trying to... I, was, I, I bet he knows something. The street in front of Wing Hop's restaurant at night. We see the lights on above the restaurant where Wing Lee has her tailoring shop. We can hear sewing machine wearing. Wing Lee's tailoring shop means she is hard at work. She's a very pretty Chinese girl. She is making trench coats and fedoras for Louis and Duke. They are watching. Also in the room is Mike, the delivery boy who rescued them earlier. Mike is holding a four rotor drone, brand new. He is reading the directions, playing with the remote control. Louis and Duke watch Mike and the drone closely. Mike says, so, food goes in here and the drinks go under the food. No more riding around in the rain. In future, all takeout food will be delivered by drone. Much faster, much better. Wing Lee says, I am so proud of Mike. Mike maneuvers the drone over Wing Lee and Louie. He drops one egg roll. They all laugh. Wing Lee finishes one trench coat. She puts it on Louie and admires her work. She almost forgets. She has also made fedoras for both of them. She puts them on and finds it very amusing. They all laugh. Wing Lee says, oh, you look good. Just like real detective. In China, all the cats can talk. Really? Yes, even hero of our government, Chairman Miao. <laughs> if you're in a pickle and you're in the dumps, if the road you have chosen has too many bumps, don't hesitate, hesitate, communicate, communicate. Pick up the phone and drop me a line. If your going is getting a little too rough, don't bother pretending that you're so tough. As quick as I can, as quick as I can, I'll take a stand, take a stand. Make sure that you're fine. I'll be there to lend you a helping hand. How about a paw? I'll be there to catch you if you stumble and fall. If you have some problems that are getting you down, I'll help you to solve them, get rid of that frown. In a flash, get your cash, got your back, got your back. rely on that. And I know that you will do the same thing for me. street in front of the hotel same time boss says out of here by the collar they enter from the alley now then where'd you see him go oh i think he went across the street over there yeah well why don't you wait here he throws her down and starts across the street and you better be here when i get back oh sure boss i'll be here i, I got no place to go boss goes into a dark alley out of here immediately gets up and runs off Police station entry the next morning. Louis and Duke go up the stairs into the huge doors. They are dressed in their detective coats and hats. People are coming in and out. No one seems to notice them. They go inside. McGuffey is typing. Louis and Duke approach. Um, Officer McGuffey? Yeah. Could we uh, talk to you for a moment? It's about your retirement. McGuffey looks up. His head swings around, looking for Sydney. Bent strolls over at that moment. Bent is sarcastic, smiling meanly. Ah, so what is this, McGuffey? Take your cat to work day? Yeah, that's right, Bent. Uh, I like to have somebody intelligent to talk to. <laughs> well, just a few weeks till retirement, eh? I sure hope nothing goes wrong. Nothing's gonna go wrong, Bent. Come on, fellas. Let me show you the evidence room. He picks up Louie and Duke and takes them into the evidence room. Bent is left at his desk, smiling, a little confused. Behind Bent, we see the poster for the St. Patrick's Day Parade. 
The evidence room is a large cage lined with guns and knives and clubs and ropes and a skull. Louis is transfixed with wonder. Duke is amazed. McGuffey sits down on the table. Okay. Now I see that Sidney was on the level. But you got to understand. Back in the day when Sidney was on the force, he had some crazy ideas. I mean, he tried to get the chief of the precinct arrested for running a larceny ring. Everybody thought he was insane. Even me. They threw him out. Poor guy. Even his wife left him. Broke his heart. Sidney was married? Yeah, nice lady. Loved the hell out of him. Just couldn't take it, I guess. I don't know where she is now. I don't blame her. People were pretty mean. Can we help? I mean, what can we do? Well, I'm not sure. I got to think. In the police station, Bent is on the phone, his hand cupped around the receiver. Behind him, we see a picture of the commissioner. Bent speaks Sotovachi into the phone. It is obvious he is calling the commissioner. Yeah, it's me. Exterior in the front of Wing Hop's restaurant. Drone has a bag of takeout hanging from it. The bag says, Wing Hop's restaurant. Mike works the control. The drone goes up. Wing Lee is enjoying it. Mike gets a quick kiss from Wing Lee. Inside Sydney's office, Sydney is on the phone. Ah, no problem, Patrick. Well, uh, well, good, just a misunderstanding. His voice trails off as he sees the drone rising outside his window with a bag of Chinese takeout under it. Uh, oh, oh no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm fine. The boss and out of here, skulking in different streets. Both are after the red cat. Red cat hears someone, the boss, coming. Boss ducks behind the corner, not wanting to be near the police car or police anything. Out of here rounds the corner, sees red cat on the police car. Red cat runs for it. Out of here chases the red cat. Boss chases out of here. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. Inside Sydney's office, Sydney and McGuffey are collaborators again, heads together. Yeah, so now I understand. Beagleman made a deal with the feds. He would testify if they'd let him come back into the country. Yeah, and he paid for this civil-minded action with his life. Now the question is, how did whoever flossed him find out that he had a deal? Had to be somebody with connections. High connections. Well? Yeah, yeah, okay, I didn't believe you then, but I believe you now. The police building. We see an exterior of the main door, lettering 80th Precinct. The camera rises to the large window on the third floor. In silhouette is the commissioner. He's on the phone. He comes toward the window. He looks out. He is still mean, bullet-headed, glaring. Back in Sydney's office, Louis is pleading with McGuffey. But we can help. Nobody notices us. They think we're just cats. You are just cats. We are just cats. But not really, because we're sort of cats. Cats plus talking. We can take off these silly hats and coats. No, no, I think we should keep them on, but... Ah, uh, well, maybe. Sidney says, I don't want you getting my cats hurt. Oh, I wouldn't think of it. On the Hudson River docks, the red cat is the end of his energy from running. Plus, he has a tummy full of diamonds. He looks around manically. He hears footsteps. Out of here appears. Oh, there you are. Here, pussy, pussy, pussy. Come to Mama. She holds out her hands. Boss appears around the corner in back of her, tiptoes. The red cat climbs up a rope to a strand of large posts. He watches the boss coming up behind out of here. On a street toward the dock, McGuffey and Sidney walk along together. Irish music is heard as the police department St. Patrick's Day bands are tuning up, bagpipes, drums, and fifes. Then a woman's screams are heard. McGuffey and Sidney break into a run. They round the corner. The boss is fighting with out of here, whacking her. Boss sees them and drops out of here. He takes off. Sidney helps out of here. McGuffey runs after the boss. After half a block, he has to slow down and then stop to get his breath. He clutches at his heart. Louie goes streaking by him after the boss. Hey, wait, no! Exterior of the corner where Sidney and out of here remain. Sidney helps out of here to a sitting position. Oh, thank you, kind sir. You okay? Yes, kind sir, but my poor little pussycat is way up there. She points to the red cat, sitting precariously on top of the pilings. He looks as mean as ever. In the background, a large tug and a barge are going by. Duke. Or well, maybe we could... He looks around for Louis, but Louis is not there. Sidney looks around as well. In the streets not far away, the boss is running, but slowing to a walk, looking for a place to hide. Louis is following him. Boss stops. Louis stops. Hey! Hey! You're under arrest! Uh, um, you, you know? The boss looks at Louis. 
the mean face of evil comprehension. He knows all about talking cats. He pulls out his revolver. <laughs> Louis ducks in the doorway. The bullets whiz past. But Louis now has a determined smile. He is fighting crime at last. Sydney and out of here remain by the pilings where the red cat is on top. Sydney tries to urge it to come down. Hey, hey listen, come down, whatever your name is. Yeah, come on down, you can't stay up there. Red Cat is amazed to hear another cat talk. The tugboat horn blows. <laughs> Red Cat freaks and loses his balance. He falls into the river. He splashes around, having trouble staying afloat. A tummy full of diamonds doesn't help. Duke looks over the edge of the Red Cat. Uh, and listen, we'll save you. Uh, I mean, Sydney will save you. Sydney starts down the ladder to the water. He grabs the Red Cat, hand around the Red Cat's tummy. The Red Cat struggles, scratches Sydney. Stop that, you little! Sydney feels the Red Cat's tummy, feels the five angels. Red Cat, get your hands off me! Sydney is amazed, then suspicious. Sydney gives the Red Cat to out of here. She grabs it tight. Oh, thank you, kind sir! Meanwhile, on the streets, McGuffey is struggling along, out of breath. Police car pulls up. Bent is driving. Hey, McGuffey, hey! You need a ride? Uh, yeah, actually, I do. Looks like you're at the end of your rope, Pop. Don't want you to collapse this close to retirement. Yeah, yeah, well, thanks. McGuffey gets in the police car, bent, jabbering along. Yeah, when I saw you there, I thought, look at that poor old man, and I saw it was my fellow police officer, almost at the end of his retirement. I wonder if he's going to make it, and I thought, what can I do to help, just for old times, anything you need? Uh, you know what I need, Bent? What I really need? A cup of coffee and a donut. Yeah, that's what I really need. Oh, yeah, well, sure. You look like you need a coffee and a donut. Bent pulls the police car into the donut shop, Deadly Donuts. Okay, you stay here, old man. Light with two sugars, right? See, I remembered. And a blueberry donut. I'll get it for you. You wait here. Take it easy. Bent goes into Deadly Donuts. McGuffey slides over behind the wheel of the police car and screeches it out of the parking lot. Bent comes out of the donut shop, sees he's been tricked, and in rage throws the coffee and donuts after the police car. Come back, you lousy... Exterior, Fifth Avenue, beginning of the St. Patrick's Day parade. Bands are getting into lines, drummers practicing, bagpipers tuning up. Lots of noise, police in dress uniforms, twirling teens, people lining the street. Exterior, Precinct 80, third floor window, the commissioner's office. Through the windows, we see the shadows of the commissioner. He is glowering at the parade preparation. His phone rings. It could be bent. Commissioner, after hearing some blather on the phone. You fool. Get him. Kill him! Exterior of the street by the dock. Out of here holds the cat tightly. Sydney remains suspicious. Uh, where'd you get that cat, lady? Oh, sir, I've had him for years. Red Cat twists in his arms. She holds him tighter. The Red Cat scratches her face. You stinking little! She attempts to strangle the Red Cat. Sydney stops her. He pulls the Red Cat away from out of here. Red Cat escapes. Red Cat runs down the street. Sydney and Duke run after him. Out of here screams. Street by the subway entrance. Red Cat has a hard time running with a tummy full of jewels. Red Cat ducks into the subway entrance, runs, falls, tumbles down the stairs. The train pulls in, people bored in confusion. Red Cat ducks into the subway door. Stand clear of the closing doors, please. The doors close just in time as Sydney and Duke come down the stairs and reach the platform. Sydney and Duke watch the train lead to the station. The Red Cat's face sneering with its paws against the window. Interior, subway car. Red Cat is sitting next to Sweet Old Lady. Sweet Old Lady says, Oh, you poor little pussycat. Are you lost? She tries to pet the Red Cat. Shut up. Sweet Old Lady does a take. Next to her is weird city guy with piercings and tattoos leans over. I'm telling you, lady, this town gets weirder every day. Exterior, the parade route, moments later. Parade has started. Noise, drums, bagpipes, fifes, people line the street, twirlers, Irish step dancers, jugglers. In the alley near the parade, Wing Lee and Mike are trying to get through the crowd to see the parade. He flies the drone up and they watch the parade on the screen on his control panel. Wing Lee has a green blouse with lettering, Kiss Me, I'm Irish. No, really. Louis, still chasing the boss, is lost in the middle of the parade, boots stomping down around him. He is clearly in trouble. He is scared. The drums are very loud. Boss is running into people through the parade, gets poked in the eye by a trombone slide, whacked by a bass drumstick, knocks people aside. <laughs> McGuffey drives up in Bent's police car. The red cat emerges from the subway entrance, somewhat the worse for wear, sees the police car, recognizes it as Bent's car. Red cat jumps on the hood, pounds on the windshield. 
It's me! It's me! I gotta see the commissioner, the commissioner! McGuffey tries to figure this out, then figures it out. McGuffey reaches out the window, grabs Red Cats, and pulls him into the police car. The commissioner? You want to see the commissioner? Okay. McGuffey drives off, one hand holding the Red Cat by the scruff of the neck. On the sidewalk by the parade, Sidney and Duke see Wing Lee and Mike. They are watching the parade on the drone camera control panel. Hey, you seen my other cat? You mean Louie? Louie is lost? Yeah, he was he was chasing a suspect, Mike says. I know, Louie. Don't worry, we'll find him. Look for him. Everybody, look for Louie. Mike works the drone controls. We see the screen as the drone camera sweeps over the parade. Nothing is seen of Louie. On a side street near the parade route, the boss, now exhausted, plops down by a wall. At the end of the alley, Bent appears. He does a take and then approaches cautiously. Well, there you are. Remember me? You were going to come and report to me. <sighs> the cat. The commissioner's cat. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The commissioner's cat. Well, the commissioner will want his cat back. And the diamonds as well. The cat took him. That lousy cat. Oh, I see. The cat took the diamonds. Oh, yeah, I believe that. Ben puts his hand on his gun. Boss reaches in his coat for his gun. Ben aims. We don't see the shot because the immediate sound is a very loud bass drum. Louis is dodging the marking feet. Confused, looks around, tries to get in step. That doesn't work. His hat falls off. He has to run back through the marchers to get his hats. Runs through the marching feet. On the sidewalk near the parade, Mike is looking for Louie on the drone camera, but no luck. He brings the drone camera back to where Wing Lee and Sidney and Duke are standing. Sidney is very worried. Duke says, let, let, let me look, let me look. Yeah, let him look. He's got cat's eyes. On the street near the 80th precinct, McGuffey pulls up in the police car. He gets out with his bundle, his overcoat. The bundle is struggling. McGuffey goes up the stairs to the precinct door. Outside the window of the commissioner's office, Commissioner is glaring through the window, spies McGuffey coming toward the building. He gets really mad, points at him in recognition. He picks up the phone, hits the speed dial, screams into the phone. We can lip read, kill him. On the sidewalk next to the parade with Wing Lee, Duke is getting strapped into the drone. Duke is in the Wing Hop's box for delivering Chinese takeout. Now, now uh, you're sure this thing is safe? Oh, yes, of course. Oh, yes, safe for a special dinner, says Wing Lee. Uh, yeah, well, okay. You, listen, you okay, buddy? Duke, with a resigned smile. Meow. The drone takes off. Duke's tail waves goodbye to everybody. Bent is now after Louis. Louis is dodging the marchers. Bent spots Louis burrowing through the parade, pushes the marchers and bagpipes out of his way, grabs Louis roughly. You miserable little... Bagpipers and cat lovers object. Hey, what are you doing to that cat? My cat, you see, the little Dickens gets away. Help, help. Sidney, Wing Lee, and Mike are watching the drone control. They can see what Duke sees, plus the back of Duke's head. Mike is working the controls. Careful, they see Bent running with Louie. Mike zooms the lens in. Duke turns his head toward the drone camera, points with his paw. That rotten, if he... In the parade, Sidney bolts into the crowd, pushing people aside, crazy to get Bent and Louie. Louie! Sidney stops and looks around, jumps down to see what he can see of Bent and Louie. Bent is seen covering Louie's mouth with his hands, banging into the parades. Louie, I'm coming, Louie! Sidney thrashes around through the crowd. The parade is disrupted. Musicians are going in all directions. Some trying to play, lying on the ground, stepping over each other, a real melee. Other marching groups pile up behind, twirlers and dancers. The Bronx High School Twirling Club is thrown into disarray. Batons are flying. Sidney grabs a baton. Bent grabs another baton. They square off for a fight with batons. Hey, mister, give me back my baton. Hey, yeah, what are you, a cop? Drop that cat, Bent. Come and get me. Way overhead, in the NYPD police helicopter, the first pilot... What the hell is going on down there? Second pilot. Looks like terrorists to me. Pilot puts the helicopter into a spiral turn and comes down to take a look. Bent and Sidney still threatening each other. Bent holds up Louie. Ah, this your cat, Sidney? What do you want with this cat? Something special about this cat? Duke is in the drone over them. Hey! Hey, up here! Bent looks up and Sidney whacks him with the girl's baton. Bent's gun falls out into the street. Bent struggles and crawls to get his gun. 
Bent releases Louie, who runs over to Sydney. Bent gets his gun. Bent is pretty crazed now. He waves the gun around. People duck and scatter. Inside the police helicopter, pilot says, Hey, that guy has a gun. Look at that, he's a cop. Pretty clever, these terrorists. But I can't go any lower. Inside the commissioner's office, McGuffey enters with Red Cat wrapped in his coat. Commissioner seething with anger. Well, well, Patrick McGuffey. Must be getting ready to retire. Be a shame if anything went wrong. Nothing's going to go wrong. Then what are you doing here? I uh, brought you something. McGuffey reveals the red cat under his wrapped coat. This yours? He said he was. He said a lot of stuff. Enough to take care of your retirement. Give me that cat. The red cat is squirming, trying to get free of both McGuffey and the commissioner. The commissioner gets control of the red cat. You know, I never thought that cats can talk. But now I think maybe they can. The red cat says, I didn't say nothing, boss. Honest. McGuffey, boss, you know, all of a sudden, I'm not so sure I want to retire. This could get interesting. Get out of here. McGuffey, as he's leaving. Nice place you got here. Be ashamed if anything happened to it. McGuffey leaves. <laughs> Commissioner is left, holding the terrified cat. Exterior, above the parade. Duke is in the drone Chinese takeout bag. The drone buzzes by Bent's head. Bent, what the hell? Bent is waving his gun around. The drone buzzes back and forth around Bent. Bent takes a shot at the drone and misses. Prade marchers and people scatter. Bent is left alone in the middle of a clearing with Sydney. Back with Mike and Wing Lee. Mike furiously trying to control the drone. Wing Lee, be careful, what is he doing? Mike steers the drone away from Bent and Sydney, higher and higher, until it passes the commissioner's window. Outside the commissioner's window, visible from inside, is the commissioner holding the red cat by the tail, shaking him to dislodge the diamonds. The commissioner turns and sees the drone hovering outside the window. Duke gives a little wave. In the street, Bent, crazed, fires at the drone twice. First shot hits the window of the commissioner's office. The second shot hits the red cat's tail. The tail is severed, leaving the commissioner holding a disembodied tail. The red cat tailless runs for it, screaming. Inside the NYPD helicopter, the pilot makes a motion to the co-pilot. The co-pilot presses the gun trigger. At the same split second, Sydney dives on Bent, knocks Bent down and out of the line of fire. But Sydney is shot. He falls. Sydney lies in the street. People circle around him in horror. Close up on horrified Louis. Louis approaches Sydney's body, aghast, broken hearted. He falls on Sydney's body, crying. Sydney! The action slows, and we are left with Louis weeping on Sydney's body. Sydney, don't die! After a long fade, Newspaper headlines go by. Gang tied to police head. Police commissioner indicted. Cop pleads guilty. Widespread investigation begins. St. Patrick's Day hero with a picture of Sydney. Pictures in the newspapers are commissioner being perp walked, bent under arrest. Out of here, split, boss in mugshots. At a newspaper stand, we see Marilyn reading the headlines. She is very sad. In the hospital room, Sydney is reading the racing form, trying to concentrate on horses and races. He is on a drip with visible bandages, some flowers from his friends, lying comfortably next to him on either side are Louis and Duke, not in detective coats, Yankees in Mets hats. On the table next to the hospital bed is a box from Wing Hop's Chinese restaurant. Louis is reading fortune cookies. Listen to this one, Sydney. A lucky man is a hero to his friends. Ah, eh, so what? What's the lucky number? Ah, uh, 14. Sydney, reading from the race lineups. 14, 14, number 14. Uh, Mama's little egg roll. 20 to 1 at Hialeah. I say go for it. You'd be a fool not to. And you ain't no fool. McGuffey appears at the hospital room door. Uh, Sydney, you've got a visitor. A woman comes up behind McGuffey. We see the slight profile. She is sad. McGuffey puts an arm around her and brings her into the room. Sydney looks up from his paper. Louis and Duke look up. Marilyn comes to the side of the bed. Um, hello, Sydney. Sydney looks up and reacts. 
The last person he ever thought he'd see again. Marilyn? Marilyn says, Sydney, I was wrong. I'm so sorry. Sydney, after a pause, that's okay. That's okay. So, uh, who is that? Hey, Marilyn, I want you to meet some friends. Hello. Duke says, hello, Mrs. Katz. In the closing credits, long panoramic of New York City, the Hudson, sunny day, Wingley and Mike and Sydney and Marilyn and McGuffey are having a picnic on the parkland on the west side, all very idyllic. Sydney still has bandages. Mike has a drone control panel. And Wingley gives Mike a big kiss. And overhead, the drone now carrying both Louis and Duke flies by the George Washington Bridge in the background through the inverted arch and into the blue sky and the afternoon sun.